current events, Bible prophecy, the ancient past. How does it all fit together? Find out now. This is Pictures of the End. And thank you for joining us today. You are listening to Pictures of the End. My name is Tim Rumsey, and we're going to continue our study of the book of Daniel today. Today's episode is titled Daniel's Three Angels, and we're going to be looking at three of the stories in the book of Daniel and comparing them with a passage in Revelation chapter 14, sometimes referred to as the Three Angels' Messages. I'd like to start by reading those messages, and then we will notice some parallels with the book of Daniel. So in Revelation chapter 14, beginning in verse number 6, we read this, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation, and kindred, and tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God, and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come. And worship him that made heaven, and earth, and the sea, and the fountains of waters. So this is the first angel in Revelation chapter 14. It carries the message of the everlasting gospel, the way of salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. And it also calls all people to fear God and give glory to him. As Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 10 verse 31, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it to the glory of God. So here is a call, uh, really an explanation. What does it mean to accept the gospel? What does it mean to live by the power of the gospel? Uh, one thing that that means is to live for God's glory rather than for our own honor and pleasure. There's also a warning in this first angel about the hour of God's judgment that it has come. And uh, certainly, as we study the character of God in the Bible, you know, the Bible is so clear that God is love, and that love includes justice and judgment. A loving God will not allow sin to continue forever. And so an important part of God's character is this judgment process uh, that uh, he's actually going through right now. And we'll look at some of those prophecies in more detail as we continue our study of the book of Daniel. Finally, that first angel ends with a call to worship God as creator. And again, Revelation 14, verse 7 says, And worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. So here is a reminder that we did not just arrive here by chance. Life did not develop um, through naturalistic or materialistic processes. Uh, this is a call to recognize God as our creator, the one who created everything and the one who continues to sustain life. And certainly these are reasons to worship God. Now the second angel continues in Revelation 14, verse 8. And there followed another angel, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. So here is a warning against blindly following the systems of this world, uh, the direction that this world is taking. And Revelation says an awful lot about Babylon that we're not going to get into today, but it includes a... Uh, unified, uh, combined uh, human enterprise that ends up, sadly, being against God, in fact, in rebellion against God. So there are political aspects. There are economic aspects to Babylon. There are uh, military aspects to Babylon, and certainly religious and spiritual aspects as well. Here is a warning that this whole system of, of humanity and its rebellion against God is going to come crashing down. And uh, Revelation chapter 18 actually talks about the fall and the destruction of Babylon. And because God cares uh, for all people and because he doesn't want anybody to needlessly be destroyed when Babylon falls, he calls people to come out. So in Revelation 18 verse 4, John says this, I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. So here's a call from God to come out from these systems of the world, whatever those systems may be, that are uh, keeping people from God, that are holding people in confusion and uh, in deception as well, and to come back to a true worship of God. Now the third angel in Revelation 14 continues, and this is the warning about the mark of the beast. So in verse 9, we read this, 
And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest, day nor night, who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Certainly a fearful warning here about or against receiving the mark of the beast. There are two possible outcomes uh, for humanity in the book of Revelation. One is that you receive the seal of God. This is described in Revelation chapter 7, the first few verses. The seal of God is placed on the foreheads, symbolically speaking, of those that serve God. In fact, the angel that carries the seal of God is commissioned to place it on the foreheads of the servants of God. And of course, a servant is one who uh, obeys and uh, fulfills the will of their master. So the seal of God is placed on those who love God, who uh, choose to serve and obey him because they love him. They love what he's done for them, uh, and they want to be like him. They want to be with him for eternity. The other possible outcome for humanity in the book of Revelation is this mark of the beast. Interestingly, it's placed in the forehead as well, just like the seal of God, or it can be placed in the hand. And this simply signifies that, uh, you know, the devil will accept anybody's service, whether it's genuine or not. So a genuine uh, worship or service would be indicated by a mark in the forehead, whereas uh, somebody just going along because, you know, maybe they don't truly believe this or they don't care, but they're just going to do it because they're told, uh, that might indicate the mark in the hand. At any rate, we have this warning about the mark of the beast. And then this verse at the end, which really summarizes the entire three angels' messages. This is Revelation 14, verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. If we want to know how to uh, survive the events that lay before us, if we want to know how to stay close to God, how to have a faith that is not shaken, then this verse really explains it for us. Here is the patience of the saints. First of all, we must have patience. Um, We must be willing to let our lives unfold according to God's timetable and according to God's plan. And sometimes that's easier to do than others. When things are going well, uh, life is easy, um, it's a lot easier to have patience, right? But when things become difficult, when we go through those trials when life is hard, then it can be more difficult to trust in God and certainly to wait on his timing in our lives. But we're told here in Revelation 14, verse 12, that God is trying to build this patience into our lives so that we can have the patience of the saints. And then these two characteristics, here are they that keep the commandments of God. That's pretty clear, right? We have the law of God, the Ten Commandments, very clearly explained in the Bible. So, Uh, Love to God, love to man, uh, all of these wrapped into these Ten Commandments. And finally, the final characteristic is that they also have the faith of Jesus. Now, some versions say faith in Jesus, and this is absolutely correct. We must have faith in Jesus for what he has done for us, what he promises to do in us. But we also need to have the faith of Jesus. Now, what kind of faith did Jesus have? If you've ever read uh, or heard the accounts of Christ's final hours on the cross, when he was just about to die, he cried out and said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That's recorded in Matthew chapter 27, verse 46. Even though Jesus had told his disciples numerous times that he would die and then rise again on the third day, um, when he was hanging on the cross, the weight of sin, and that's our sin, that's my sins, that's your sins, it's everybody's sins in this world, uh, the weight of sin was so, hanging so heavily on Jesus that he could not see through the portals of the tomb. In other words, even though he had known this beforehand, as he was going through that experience, the, the, uh, the darkness of the weight that was on him prevented him from feeling or, or being able to uh, 
to, to, to recognize or to feel that he was going to be able to rise again. And yet, in spite of that, he chose to go ahead and die, even if it meant in his mind that he would never rise again, that this was an eternal death. Now, that's true love, isn't it? The Bible says God is love. And um, sometimes we kind of gloss over that statement, and we don't really think about what does it mean that God loves us. Well, here's a picture of it, friends. Jesus was willing to suffer eternal death just to give each one of us the opportunity to choose him. Not even a guarantee, right? Just the opportunity to choose him. And this is the kind of faith that Jesus had. He was demonstrating a faith that would not let go of its hold of his heavenly Father, even when he could not see what that would mean for him. And friends, we we each uh, have these experiences in our lives. We have these times in our lives, don't we? Where we um, know that God is asking us to do something. We know that he is leading us somewhere, but we're not sure that we want to follow. Because what's what will happen if I truly follow God? If I truly surrender my life to him, what is God going to ask me to do? Is he going to ask me to move somewhere or to uh, start doing something or stop doing this or whatever it may be? And we get nervous and we get scared and we get afraid and then we don't follow God. We don't exercise faith because we're not exactly sure what that is going to mean in our lives. Friends, Jesus experienced those questions as he hung on the cross. What will it mean for me? Is this it? Is this, will I never rise from the dead? You know, if I go ahead with and, and, and follow my Father's will and pay the price of sin for a guilty world. But the quality of faith Jesus had was that he hung on to his Father's will and his Father's promises, even when he could not see what that would mean. And friends, the Bible tells us in Revelation 14, verse 12, that this is the kind of faith that God is looking for and that he wants to build within um, each one of us today. So there's a great challenge for us, keeping the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Now, these are the three angels' messages in Revelation chapter 14. When we come back from the break in a minute or two here, we're going to look at three stories in the book of Daniel, and we're going to see some very fascinating parallels between those stories and these three angels' messages. You know, it's one thing to read about something in the Bible or to read a prophecy, but um, I think most of us remember things better. We remember the lessons better if we receive it in the form of a story. This is why stories are so popular with people of all ages. And so we're going to look at these three stories. The first one is Nebuchadnezzar's dream in Daniel chapter 4. This is not the dream of the big image. This is one he had a few years later, the dream of a great tree that gets cut down. So we'll look at that, and we'll see that that is a parallel of the first angel's message, or kind of an explanation of it. And then we'll look at Daniel chapter 5, which is the handwriting on the wall. Belshazzar, the king of Babylon, uh, is slain that night. Babylon falls to its enemies. We'll see the parallels there with the second angel's message, the warning about Babylon falling. And then finally, we'll look at Daniel in the lion's den, and we'll see the parallels between that story and the third angel's message. So we've got a lot to look at yet, a lot of good Bible stories coming up. We'll look at those right after the break when we come back. Don't go away. We'll be right back. Is the Protestant Reformation finished? Was it simply a passing family feud within Christianity, an insignificant historical footnote with little relevance to modern life? Is Christianity destined to reunite? Find the answers to these questions and more in the new book, Is the Reformation Finished? by Tim Rumsey. Available at major booksellers, Is the Reformation Finished? shows how today's rapid religious movements are fulfilling Bible prophecy. Learn what is really going on within Christianity right now and where the Bible says these movements will lead. CD and DVD sets of this series are also available. Get your copy of Is the Reformation Finished? online at picturesoftheend.com or call toll-free 855-HIS-TRUTH. Call 855-HIS-TRUTH. That's 855-447-8788. 
Hello, friends. Welcome back. You are listening to Pictures of the End. The title of today's episode is Daniel's Three Angels. In the first part of today's program, we looked at the three angels' messages in Revelation chapter 14. And now in the second half of our program, we're going to look at parallels in three of these stories in the book of Daniel. So let's dive right in. In Daniel chapter 4, King Nebuchadnezzar dreams a dream, and he dreams about a a great, beautiful, large tree that uh, is providing shelter and shade and, uh, you know, a a habitat for animals and birds of the air and so forth. And as he watches, uh, this tree gets cut down and an iron band is placed around its trunk. And he wakes up from this dream wondering, what in the world does this mean? Kind of like his dream of several years before when he saw that big metal statue. And he calls in all of his wise men and his counselors and his magicians and so forth. And just like it happened with that previous dream, none of them can explain what it means. Finally, Nebuchadnezzar calls Daniel. And um, once again, just as before, Daniel is able to interpret what this dream means. And Daniel tells the king, oh, <laughs> oh king, I wish this was a, uh, a prophecy or a dream concerning your enemies, not you. And the king says, essentially, just tell me the truth, Daniel. So Daniel explains to the king that this tree represents him, Nebuchadnezzar, and that he is this great king. God has blessed him. He's placed him in a position of responsibility. He's, you know, ruler over nations. But then Daniel gives this warning. He says, uh, God will judge you if you do not do what is right, if you do not... uh, give justice to your subjects, if you continue to take all this glory to yourself, uh, you'll be cut down just like this tree was. And uh, Daniel gives this amazing prophecy that seven times would pass over the king. In other words, seven years. And um, this is in Daniel chapter 4, verse 23, and Daniel's speaking. I'll back up to verse 22. He says, It is thou, O king, that art grown and become strong, for thy greatness is grown, and reacheth unto heaven, and thy dominion to the end of the earth. And whereas the king saw a watcher and a holy one coming down from heaven, and saying, Hew the tree down and destroy it, yet leave the stump of the roots thereof in the earth, even a band of iron and brass in the tender grass of the field, and let it be wet with the dew of heaven, and let his portion be with the beasts of the field till seven times pass over him. Now, this is exactly what ends up happening to King Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, As Nebuchadnezzar recounts his story, and Daniel chapter 4 is actually a letter. It's Nebuchadnezzar's testimony. He ends up serving the God of heaven, but not until after this humiliating experience that he records. He says, 12 months later, I was walking along the palace in the kingdom of Babylon, and I said, is not this the great Babylon that I have built Uh, the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty. And the words have barely left Nebuchadnezzar's mouth. When the judgment falls upon him, he loses his mind. Uh, Basically, he goes insane. And for the next seven years, Nebuchadnezzar acts like a wild beast out in the field. uh, His hair grows long. His nails grow long. He crawls on his arms and legs. Uh, I don't know if he sounded like a cow or... (laughs) But he's, he's completely lost it for seven years. And finally, at the end of these seven years, uh, he says in verse 34, At the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lift up mine eyes unto heaven, and mine understanding returned unto me, and I blessed the Most High, and I praised and honored him that liveth forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. So here is an amazing testimony from this pagan king, that is finally brought to recognize the authority and the majesty of the God of heaven. And um, Nebuchadnezzar ends up giving the praise to God the Father rather than himself. So we see here uh, an illustration of some of the principles in that first angel's message. Uh, Fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come. And uh, what a challenge for each of us in our own lives. In some ways, we're all like little Nebuchadnezzars, aren't we? And uh, we like to live life our own way with our own ideas. 
And if we're honest, it's, many of the things that we do and say are for our own benefit, for our own gain, and for our own glory, rather than for God's. So uh, an amazing story here that has lessons for each one of us. And encouragement as well. God accepted Nebuchadnezzar after he came back through this experience. God will accept each one of us as well when we turn to him, when we choose to worship and honor him. Now, the second angel in Revelation 14, verse 8, warned about the fall of Babylon. In the very next chapter of Daniel, Daniel chapter 5, we have the story of the fall of ancient Babylon. And it happened this way. Belshazzar, who is the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar, is now uh, acting as king on the throne. And one night he holds a great feast for a thousand of his lords, and they drank wine, and they got drunk, and did a whole bunch of other nasty things. And uh, in the middle of this drunken orgy, a hand appears on the walls of the palace, and it writes uh, something mysterious that nobody can understand. Once again, the magicians are brought in, the, uh, uh, all the wise men, and they cannot interpret this writing. Finally, Daniel, who by this time is a very old man, he is brought in, and uh, he interprets the handwriting on the wall. And this is what Daniel says. Uh, this is Daniel chapter 5, verse 25. And this is the writing that was written. Many, many, take you farsen. This is the interpretation of the thing. Many, God hath numbered thy kingdom and finished it. Tekel, thou art weighed in the balances and art found wanting. And Perez, thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. And sure enough, that very night, in fact, as Daniel is speaking, the armies of the Medes and the Persians are walking under the city wall. They've diverted the Euphrates River. The gates have been left up through uh, arrogance, probably, on Belshazzar's part. And those uh, invading armies walk right into the city. They kill Belshazzar. They, they you know, wipe out his guard. And uh, Babylon falls. So here we see an illustration of the principles about why Babylon falls at the end of time. It's for many of the same reasons that uh, ancient Babylon fell. It's arrogance. It's pride. It's a refusal to uh, worship God or to recognize God's authority. In fact, many of the vessels and cups that Belshazzar and his party goers were using that night were from the temple in Jerusalem. So they had taken the sacred holy things of God, whereas Nebuchadnezzar had taken them and stored them, uh, maybe partially out of respect for a foreign god. Belshazzar has no respect whatsoever of the holy things. And he's using these in a blasphemous manner. And he ends up paying the price. Babylon comes crashing down. And um, when you look in Revelation, many of the same principles are at work here with uh, spiritual Babylon or mystery Babylon at the end of time. The things of God that are holy and sacred are taken by the, this, uh, this power at the end of time. There is blasphemy involved. You know, there's just outright rebellion against God. And so the warning comes, listen, this whole human enterprise is going to come crashing down. God is not going to allow this to continue forever. And again, that call to come out, you know, be separate from this. Worship God according to the Bible. Uh, worship God according to truth. And um, just like Daniel was the last man standing in Babylon, he, he did not die that night. He ended up serving the next king, Cyrus, that had taken over Babylon. The same promise is given that uh, God can carry his people through and that he will carry his people through if they are faithful to him. Now that brings us to our third and final story today, and that is the story of Daniel in the lion's den. And we're just a few brief parallels here with the third angel's message. In the third angel's message that warns about the mark of the beast, there is a law that goes out saying you must worship in such and such a way, and if you not, do not, there is a death penalty. That's all explained there in Revelation. And we find something similar happening, happening to Daniel in Daniel chapter 6. His enemies want to get rid of him. They're jealous of him, that he's been put in a very high position in the kingdom. So they look for a, an excuse or a reason to discredit Daniel, and they can't find one. He has uh, lived his life in such a blameless way, both his private life and his public life um, in service to the king. They simply cannot find anything against him, and they finally decide, 
we will not find any occasion against this Daniel, except we find it against him concerning the law of his God. That's Daniel 6, verse 5. So they recognize that only in Daniel's uh, worship of the God of heaven will they be able to find or manufacture an excuse to destroy him. So that's exactly what they do. They go to the king and say, Oh, king, you're such a great king. We've decided that there should be a law just for 30 days that uh, no one can worship anybody else except you. And if they do, we'll throw them into the lion's den. And Cyrus uh, says, Hey, that's a good idea. So he signs the decree into law without even really thinking about it. So the trap is set. Daniel ignores this um, blasphemous law, and he continues praying to God with his window open toward Jerusalem. And sure enough, he gets arrested, and sure enough, he gets thrown into that den of lions, and God saves him. Uh, If you've been at church at all, you know this story, right? Uh, God sends his angel, and that angel shuts the lion's mouths, and Daniel is rescued in this amazing deliverance from this death decree regarding worship. Well, those are the same issues, friends, that the third angel uh, warns about. And just like God saved Daniel, he will save his people at the end of time as well. The issues will be very similar. Uh, That third angel's message and the mark of the beast all concern uh, issues regarding the law of God. And this is why the three angels' messages end with this call to keep the commandments of God. Revelation 14, verse 12. I'll read it again. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So if we want to know, you know, what do I need to do in my life? You know, what is God looking for? Again, it's very simple. It's laid out right here for us. God is wanting us to accept his gift of salvation as explained in the gospel. He is wanting us to surrender our lives to him, to choose to serve him, to obey him, and with the Holy Spirit's help to live a life that pleases God. That's keeping the commandments of God. And then he wants to build within us faith that will trust him no matter what happens. And so when these difficult times come in our lives, rather than simply asking why and then giving up our faith or turning our back on God, uh, the challenge for each one of us is to hold his hand more tightly, to cling to those promises that God has given in his word and to say, Lord, Even though I don't understand why you're allowing these things to happen, I trust that there's a reason. I know that you love me because the Bible says so. And uh, I choose to trust in you. And as we do this, God will work miracles in our lives, in our hearts, in our minds, in the circumstances around us, and he'll draw us closer to him. Well, friends, we are out of time. Thank you for joining me today. I hope that you will join me next time for more Pictures of the End. You have been listening to Pictures of the End, a production of Pathway to Paradise Ministries. Pictures of the End is available via your favorite podcast service and also at www.picturesoftheend.com.